Um, so I guess I wanted to sort of look at three strands and then like go on to look at sort of resistance. Um, but the three strands I've been thinking about recently, so to give some context, I'm trying to get like a Black, uh, Black, Black Lives Matter style like campaign going in Oxford and a group of us have met. It's really weird because like of all the black people in Oxford, well there are quite a few of us, but um, of all the black people in Oxford managed to find like only the other, like the other black people who happen to be American as well. It's like <laughs> really like <laughs> really little interest from like people who are people of colour and British. But um, in terms of trying to like draw together loads of things that are happening on campus, so we had the uh, Solid Ferguson Solidarity Tour um, this term, but we also had the Marine Le Pen demo, and um, I've been trying to work out like yeah some overarching message that we can have in terms of like when we. Um, start doing action. So I've been thinking about it in three strands um, and they're sort of like three areas of debate where I think the terms of the debate need to be shifted when we talk about race. Um, and the first area is safety, um, the second one is um, like freedom and political legitimacy and like that sort of freedom of speech debate which is really weird and bizarre and the last one is uh, talking about like home and like ownership of things so um, that we're looking largely at like immigration. So on the safety point, I guess there's this weird politics um, where you find liberals and um, like sort of the identity politics brigade like falling into the same pot, and it's around this politics of like fear, this politics of being feeling threatened. Um, and one of the things we never really, well, I find that people often don't stop to think about is like what are the causes of that fear. So for instance. Um, listening to uh, Dan Wilson talk about the day he shot Mike Brown, where he was talking about how he was really scared for his life, um, how he thought that if he got hit one more time, he would have died. And like looking at pictures of him afterwards, he barely had a black eye, right? So there's often very little sense in which we interrogate like where that fear comes from. And one of the interesting, more interesting analysis I read of that <coughs> was talking about how it feeds into this narrative of black people as sh like a superhuman. Um, I can't remember the study, but there was a study which found that yeah, people are far more likely to think black people have superpowers, mm -hmm. and it's um, it it does it it is a hangover from imperialist narratives uh, um, in the in the colonial period, um, and so I think there's something um, which which has to be gone out basically, which is this idea that like, um, or exposing the myth that like all fear is legitimate, that all fear is legitimate to stop us from acting. So one of the really ironic things I found was um, after the Le Pen demo that we had in Oxford, people invoking safety um, as like um, objections that was like, you should feel safe to be able to go and hear a fascist speak on campus. And it was just like, what, what? <laughs> um, and I, um, yeah, I, I, I found that really frustrating, but also I think it brings to head like one of the contradictions of the like mm -hmm. um, identity politics crowd because what they do is they invoke fear or the, the feeling of being threatened um, in order to avoid having particular conversations. Mm -hmm. right? So one of the really interesting things I found recently is that the best opposition to trigger warnings on academic literature um, in, in, in um, lectures came from a black academic where she said there's this presumption that every space um, is like neutral um, in, in the first instance and it's, it's people who pollute it and so this idea that if we just rid ourselves of certain language um, or certain words then that space becomes safe and it's this desire for safety um, I was speaking to Barnaby earlier on today, where he was saying, actually, it comes from different places, right? It comes from having politics which have different aims. So this idea of like purifying sa um, spaces and making spaces safe comes from a politics which focuses on purifying the self, right? On on um, being the most ethical you can be as an individual, but not a politics of social transformation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of the things in, in um, resistance movements is when you're resisting opposition, uh, when you're resisting oppression, when you're resisting exploitation, that can't be a safe space, right? You have to confront these issues head on. Um, and so one of the key things I, I, I'm sort of looking to do is work out a way in which we can have that division, right? Because I'm not saying there's no value in like spaces which are primarily there for caregiving, right? Um, the, those spaces have their own value in that 
it gets tiring um, and you need sometimes to know that people are looking out for you, but those spaces can't seep into our political spaces. Those spaces can't prevent us from acting. Those uh, spaces, for instance, can't be like what happened in uh, December where the NUS um, leadership pulled out of um, the free education demo citing liberation concerns but wouldn't explicate what these were. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's sort of that bit. Um, I think this goes further though. So this idea of fear is often what's used to legitimize oppression as well, right? So <coughs> this, this fear of the other, um, this idea that um, people of color can pose in and of themselves a threat without, without having to do anything is the kind of legitim um, is a kind of idea which legitimizes um, in Western imperialism in terms of couching them as two different cultures, um, one culture which consistently poses a threat to the other just in its existence, right? And what's so interesting about that is it brings to a head one of the contradictions of liberalism, which is liberalism would talk about freedom, would talk about freedom of speech, but there's a set parameter of those, right? Because all the liberals who tell me I can't protest a fascist speaking on my campus are the same liberals who have no problem with like anti-terror speech laws or like no problem with like uh, having prevent on campus spying on students and what they're doing. Um, and I think there's this neat little trick that it has in that it says, it's okay to use coercion insofar, um, insofar as what it does is serves a net benefit or a net gain in our freedom to say what we want within the set parameter. And so it then makes it much harder for us to operate within the terms of that debate. And I think that sort of moves on to the, the second point about speech, um, freedom of speech and like um, poli uh, political legitimacy. So I got tweeted after the pandemic, it's like something like, Annie Tariba now thinks she can decide who is a legitimate political party and who is not. And it's, 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 it's really weird because this idea that as long as you have the, like, um, the sort of de jure legitimacy that comes as being a part of the state and having somebody cast a ballot for you in the election, that suddenly means that your ideas in themselves are, are, are legitimate or worth debating. And that, that's just not true, right? And um, I think there's this... The thing with people who are like revolutionary socialists is we, we operate most of, most of the time outside of the state, right? Because the state uh, represents an arm of, uh, of, of capital, the state exploits us, the state oppresses us. And so we don't have the channels within the state in order to be able to achieve recourse in the way that we would, uh, in the way that we would do otherwise. And I guess the problem is because, because of that, it's very easy for us to be cast aside as um, rejecting a legitimacy that people have come to learn or a, a, a legitimacy that people have internalised. And that makes it harder for us to engage in that debate. So us wanting to shut down a debate with, with Marine Le Pen means that we're, we're the bad guys, right? We're the, we're the people who victimise people. Um, I don't know if you saw recently the spiked... Um, university rankings on freedom of speech, and if you look at some of the things that um, if you look at some of the things that they've got pe um, university campuses down as red, like we're we're red for our harassment policy um, because our harassment policy says that like a robust debate can only happen in a situation where people aren't needlessly offensive and people aren't racist or misogynist, and that it's it's, it's this idea that it, it's. It's the sort of Charlie Hebdo thing of like, we will offend you just because we can. We'll kick you while you're down just because we can. And God help you if you try to resist that. God help you if you criticize us for that because it's our right to do that. Um, and it doesn't, it, it, it relies on completely decontextualizing relationships between people. It relies on um, stripping it of his, uh, historical uh, context um, and treating each, each sort of engagement as an, a new one. Um, Sorry. Um, yeah, so I think that sort of moves on to like the, the sort of anti-terror bill, right? Because it's this it's this this talk of freedom, it's a protection of freedom which is used. So you have the day after Charlie Hebdo, the like uh, David Cameron being like, um, what we need to do is ban WhatsApp and Snapchat. Like the the day before he was talking so like waxing lyrical about how it's so important to protect freedom, how it's so important to protect 
um, um, our, our right to say what we want to say. Um, <coughs> the next day he has an issue with the fact that we can say that without the state spying on us. And I think one of the, um, one of the things at the heart of that is, in constructing this narrative, it's just, it, 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 it's constantly a double, it's constantly double speak. It's constantly, on the one hand, we need to protect freedom, but on the other hand, we need to like make incursions on people's freedom in order to protect it. And because those incursions disproportionately affect people who lie outside of the like moderate, um, centrist like, uh, like, uh, debate, um, it's just not an issue for the large, vast majority of people. Which is why I find it so ironic, for instance, that when we protest Marina Pen being a, given a platform, that we get called enemies of um, freedom of speech when the left, like, deal, like, the left takes up the backbone of resisting government incursions of lib on civil liberties, right? Because the left are the ones who have to deal with mass, uh, mass, uh, mass arrests at, uh, at protests. The left have to deal with being spied on. Um, the left have to deal with their phone at, um, records being um, being accessed by the police, right? And so it's, it's, it, it's really weird that, yeah, I, I'm not really sure if that there's... there's anything constructive to be said on that, just that it makes me very angry. Um, and I think I've spoken really quickly, but the last thing is on like home and like ownership. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking about recently is how this debate about EU migration um, affects like broader debates about um, belonging um, and who we are. Um, and I guess UKIP sort of tries to get itself out of uh, trouble, uh, like tries to call itself not racist because it says, oh well, EU migration policy in itself is racist because it discriminates against people who aren't from Europe and therefore we can't be racist because we're fighting for immigration on terms of like, uh, what, what, like basically, yeah, we're fighting for immigration on, uh, on the terms of like, people who contribute to society. We think it should be a meritocratic system. And I think there's sort of two strands here. On the one hand, I think that in itself, that sort of rhetoric, um, I guess any rhetoric which like would root um, the ills experienced, um, which coincides with so things like wage deflation, which roots that in immigration as being the problem itself, has to be racist, right? For a couple of reasons. Firstly, because of like the historical complicity of Western like governments in um, basically the shitness of loads of people's countries, right? Um, and if you're if you if you if you profited off exploiting um, these countries, then you have you have basically no right to then turn around and blame people for moving um, away from them. I think secondly, the other thing is um, in terms of oh wait, I was on a strand. Yeah, I think, uh, secondly, in terms of um, immigration, what, what it serves to do is construct a, like an economy of debt. Um, so I was reading an article about transgender people pinkwashing um, like the Israeli state, and it was, um, well, I, I've sort of lifted some of this analysis from that, but I think what, what's really interesting about it is when the Labour Party, who going into election will probably, the Labour Party Greens will probably have the best rhetoric on immigration, that's not in a good sense, just like the, the least shit rhetoric, right? It's a rhetoric of, but they're good for the economy, um, and they serve a net benefit, they won't come here and take our benefits, they won't come here and be a sponge, um, be, a, be a drain on the state. And um, the implication of that is that immigrants are welcome in the UK insofar as they are beneficial to, materially beneficial to those who are already existing, right? Um, I think there is a sense in which the implicit claim of that is that they still don't belong, right? They, they can't call this place home. Um, for um, migrants from um, Eastern Europe, that's like mostly a, 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 an issue in like the first, second generation, right? But for people of colour, there is something about us that like distinguishes us from everyone else. Yeah. In a sense that, that there is no like no matter how long you spend here, you still get told to go home. You still get you still get made to feel as though you don't belong here. You could be third, fourth, fifth generation. Um, and so I think that I think that there needs to be a more fundamental challenge to that rhetoric. And I think it's very it's very uh, 
a sort of very um, tempting to fall into that rhetoric of just because it, it takes hold sometimes it's like if you can prove numerically like empirically that they're they're wrong then like it's sort of it, it, it's easier to sort of gain a purchase on the people who would be swayed by those arguments but I think they're going into the next election I think that's the kind of that's the kind of argument precisely that the left needs to be challenging because it has it has I think it's more pernicious because an argument which frames itself in being anti-racist, but in, in, at its core is racist, um, is more pernicious than one that we can outrightly say you can only make that claim if you're a racist, right? Um, yeah, sorry. Those are thoughts. Yeah,